welcome to Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 40, otherwise known as season 3, episode 4. Uh, I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, your other host, Jacob Davison. How you doing, Jacob? Doing well. Um, ready for another episode. Hopefully we're all ready for another episode. Uh, also with us, as always, is your other other host, uh, John Korea. How you doing, John? Doing pretty well. Got a whole new setup. Uh, still on the bed, but now I got a little table. You know, one of those like, like I've been, I'm sick, and my mom's gonna make me soup and sandwiches all day. Like bed table things. It's pretty great. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully there's a there's a big change in quality of of audio on my end because of this brand new table and no other reason. <laughs> And also, me and John still are uh, podcasting from from bed. Oh yeah, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yep, <laughs> unless I go back on the road again. Yeah, and then you do it from from your hot car. No, never again. <laughs> yeah, we need to never do that again uh, for for your sake. I was about to say, <laughs> you want me to never do that again? I nearly died in Waco. That would have been ironic. That would have been terrible podcaster dies from overheating in Waco. I that's going to be the name of your of the next movie you write. Nearly died in Waco. Nearly dead in Waco. <laughs> Nearly going to take it's going to take a while. I'm terrible <laughs> at like sitting down and putting pen to paper. What pen to paper? What are you in the in the 70s? You uh, just open the laptop. Yeah, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's just something nice about using my handwriting that looks like, you know, a third grader's handwriting and oh. just like it's legible. It's just not pretty. That's, but that's two years more advanced than my handwriting. But the thing was with me, and this was the same way like back in school, it, I can listen to a lecture and, and all of my classmates would record it and listen back to it. I need to take notes with my hand. I can't even type them. It needs to be handwriting for things to stick in my head, you know? Now, there, there's scientific basis in that. If you handwrite it, then it sticks in your brain. Like, that, I actually had that as a part of a, of a SAT testing course. Ah, okay. Well, oh. it doesn't surprise me because that's, I'm living proof that that, you know, that, that that's how it is. Wow, listeners, you are in for a treat today. <laughs> Not only are we going to talk about horror, but we're going to tell you how to remember shit better. Yeah. Good. So grab a pen and paper and take uh, notes. Take notes. <laughs> we're quizzing you at the end of this one. Because also, we all saw The Invisible Man. Yeah, we did. Yeah, and yeah we did. You, you all probably have seen The Invisible Man, too, because I think it had a pretty good opening weekend, and we're in the second weekend as we record. But um, Right, so it'll be a couple of weeks. I think I could safely say that we all loved it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would say that's an understatement. The yeah. screening Jacob and I went to, everyone just fucking lost it and it's so great yeah not to spoil anything but it's so great seeing an entire audience cheer you know yep. when a movie ends like um the, especially with that third act like there was just it was almost standing some people were in such shock it was great me and john were at a sold out uh pre-screening at the egyptian theater and it was just electrifying. Like, everybody was really into it. Like, a lot of screams, a lot of gaffs, a lot of uh, yelling. Like, a uh, fully active audience, and it was amazing. It's that kind of movie. There, there are a couple of legitimate holy shit moments that, like, yeah. mm-hmm. where your jaw drops, and you're like, did that really just happen? Or you're even, qu- you're like, wait, what just happened? And then they show you something, and you're like, oh, oh, yeah. So It's so well-crafted. And Elizabeth Moss is is just a queen so amongst queens. Mm-hmm. She, I mean, she can do no wrong. Oh yeah, been, been a huge fan of her ever since Mad Men and Get Him to the Greek. Uh, and she's always brought like really good uh, energy to roles. But with this one, she really went into it. And one of the things that I really respect about the movie is how accurate it is with the uh, abusive domestic partner relationship everything from her what she has to do to escape uh to just the effect it has afterwards to how he acts and what like he could he could easily go full invisible man and like do like the ooh it's a floating pen ooh look it's pants <laughs> yeah. dancing you know the goofy stuff but really all the tactics that he did while messing with her while invisible are are the same type of tactics that he was doing for years and these are all tactics and patterns that abusive partners use and i thought that was so well done because it it's so real and it makes it so much more terrifying 
the whole movie is kind of a metaphor for that too because even though she had quote escaped from the relationship he's there's even a real heavy-handed reference he goes he'll haunt you if you let him don't let him you know it's like and all of her um you know the police and her friends and everybody is like oh you're crazy you're crazy it's just it's typical gaslighting so the whole movie yeah. n- not just the real obvious you know escape the relationship and he comes after a thing but the whole concept of the invisible man haunting her is like is is just an analogy for someone who has escaped an abusive relationship i thought it's just so well so well written so well made yeah Absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. And it was also so great because it portrays all of the negative stuff. And I always I always say this uh, because I used to teach uh, women and children safety classes. So we use examples from popular media, you know, sleeping with the enemy and a bunch of other movies to show like, you know, this is what happens. But one of the most important things you can show when you're depicting relationships like this is that the, the survivor getting support. And that is what really uh, made me proud of this movie is not only did we see parts of people not believing her or people thinking, you know, you know, not really giving her a chance, but then people coming around and people giving her that support, giving showing that support system. And that was incredible. And uh, and it, sadly, a lot of that is not connecting with some audience members. I, I've, I've gone into a few arguments on forums uh, <laughs> since, of course, because people are like, oh, I don't understand this. And it's like, well, if you actually paid attention, you would know yeah. that one well, the reasons why. But it's also great because I'm seeing a lot of people coming forward in those defending like why did she go for a job interview afterwards if she was going to get money and i saw so many people coming forward with their own story saying when i got out of this relationship i just wanted some sense of normality i wanted to provide for myself and get that basis of normality back and i think that's incredible that not only is this film really well made and it's a good scary because it's scary as shit jacob jumped like three feet in the air at a few points and i was right next to him in the air so but uh, that it's portraying that and like people are starting those discussions about abuse and I think that's that's really awesome and to expect that from a universal monster movie is just I think that's a pretty great achievement my only beef with it is, and this isn't really a beef but this actually is probably a testament to how well she knew her abuser. She figured it out really quickly. Like when stuff starts happening, she goes, he must have figured out a way to be invisible. You know, <laughs> That's I'm just such like, a big leap. <laughs> but the thing is, he was an optics engineer. I mean, yeah. she knew what he did for a living. So I think... Um, at least I've talked myself into thinking that that's what that's why she was able to put that together is because she knew him so well and knew right knew what his field of expertise was but yeah I was and also if it had taken her longer to figure out I mean the movie is already what two hours and five minutes we don't want it to be any longer than that yeah <laughs> right. if it had taken her any longer to figure it out we, we have a two and a half hour movie and then you know then you're waiting for a director's cut that's three hours yeah yeah although um it was an interesting it was interesting how uh john you, you brought up uh like how he used uh sleeping with the enemy in uh the safety class because uh you know lee winnell mentioned that like a lot of those types of movies influenced uh his direction with the invisible man like the day before uh the screening they had the uh thrillathon uh where he uh curated the movies they said most influenced uh his uh writing for the invisible man like there was misery Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct. Uh, what, what was that one? Dead, Dead Calm. Dead Calm. Dead Calm. Yeah. And uh, Fatal Attraction, all that, like all those uh, 90s era, like thrillers. Uh, and I could de- I could definitely see the influence, you know, because it it's, it's kind of a game of cat and mouse between them. And yeah. it just, and if there's one thing Lee Winnell loves, it's torturing the audience, and he just, he just did that in spades. Honestly, I there was a Q and A after our screening, and I wanted to ask a question, but I I refrained from it because the urge to just go, "Hey Lee, first of all, fuck you," because of <laughs> how tense that movie was, like in in like the nicest way possible. Fuck you, because uh, that was stress. That was pure stress, a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but I do want to address one thing. Uh, last week, or l- the last episode, we talked about Invisible Man movies. And you guys recommended 
a bunch that I hadn't seen. <laughs> and so I went and watched them. Comes. First of all, the entity, holy shit. You yeah. guys, my jaw was on the ground from five minutes into the movie until probably midway through the third act. Like, it wouldn't, I could not close my mouth. Like, just. That was so hard. That was a hardcore movie. It lost me a little bit with like the Freudian uh, psychology that was going on a bit. Yeah, you know that even at that time was a bit outdated. But Jesus Christ, that was that was that was hardcore. And I highly recommend that to anybody, especially as a double feature to The Invisible Man. That's just like a rough day, but they go hand in hand very well together. Mm-hmm. But um, the other one is I rewatched Hollow Man, which. Newfound respect for it. I have to say, I liked it a bit more this time. But James, how dare you? How dare you recommend Hollow Man 2? Like, <laughs> that Invisible Man fight scene was one minute long, and it was not worth putting up with nearly two hours of that movie. No, Hollow Man 2. It's, I, I mean, see, <laughs> it, it gains a lot on a second viewing. So you probably should oh, go back. Oh God! Yeah, actually, no. I'm I'm joking. I haven't even seen it twice. But <laughs> why, would, why would you even joke about putting someone through two viewings of Hollow Man two? Just want to see if I could get get away with it. Uh, uh, no, it I kind of evil. you know Hollow Man. It is no Hollow Man, but I kind of you know I thought it was cool. I thought it was you know the, the opening scene is one for the ages, and I I seem to remember the rain fight going on longer than 30 seconds but <laughs> it, it, i don't know maybe uh maybe i was just so maybe i rewound it <laughs> it was it was weird because i haven't been excited to watch christian slater and something in a really long time and i was really excited about christian slater and hollow man 2 for him. some reason yeah. but i'm 95 percent sure he did all of his bits in like two days like oh, i'm he sure was, he did barely in the movie yeah. and when he was it was like yeah it was and, and it, when he was it was all voiceover there there's like a, a couple of flashback scenes but it's all yeah it's all voiceover he was probably doing it from his bed like you guys they probably yeah. <laughs> but but even then like his voiceover wasn't that much like it was just like a ah, every now and then or something <laughs> like that <laughs> like no there was no like I'm Christian Slater, and I'm going to say something real cool right now. Ooh, that was a decent Christian Slater. Yeah. I'm kind of proud of myself. Maybe you could sub in for Hollow Man 3. <laughs> they might do that now. Who, who owns the rights to Hollow Man? Bring back Christian Slater. Have a Christian Slater versus Kevin Bacon. Yeah, they got Hollow Man versus Hollow Man. You thought they were dead, but they were just <laughs> invisible. Yeah, although they're, they'll, the fight will probably only be like 10 seconds because you know like what what kind of budget would that get well i want to see it with like the type of budget of like the movies that were being made and be kind rewind where it's just like absolutely nothing you just <laughs> see like the strings and everything uh, like great. they do terrible green screen of uh kevin bacon and christian slater and just slapping each other around <laughs> <laughs> exactly maybe christian slater and kevin bacon should be in the new face off <laughs> maybe hollow man three face off two. Oh, yeah did they say who's gonna be in that new face off movie i i haven't heard i i was jockeying for uh charlize theron and samara weaving but i don't know if that'll happen yeah we, yeah we talked about that last time i want to see samara weaving go full nick cage i think she can do it oh yeah i mean it looks like she's <laughs> doing that in uh guns akimbo yeah all right so what else has been going on the, the last couple weeks well uh i went to the uh fourth anniversary of cinematic void last week um you know, and for those who don't know, Cinematic Void is kind of a film series they do at the Egyptian and Arrow theaters where they show genre and horror stuff. So to celebrate their fourth anniversary, they did one of the craziest double features I think I've ever been to, uh, George Romero's Day of the Dead with Death Wish 3. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That is a random and great double feature. Kind of like when I saw Streets of Fire and Last Action Hero. There's like almost nothing in common but it works really well how, how well did they go pair together surprisingly well i mean they did feel like there was a bit of a well they came out about the same time so it did kind of feel stylistically similar uh, in that way but yeah no it's just fun uh like big crowd for day of the dead like everybody applauded when bub uh had his scenes in day of the dead because everybody loves bub oh Bub's a favorite. Is Death Wish 3 the one that started getting really corny, or is that Death, Death Wish 4? Uh, the Crackdown? 
I <laughs> probably Death Wish for the crackdown. I I can't remember which one where where cuz the first two were actually pretty serious as far as movies Although I think go. although this was the Golan and Globus canon Death Wish movie, so this is yeah. probably the turning point. Yeah. Uh, although it was pretty amazing and also this was my first Death Wish movie. This was the first Death Wish movie I'd ever seen. Really? Yeah. You haven't you haven't even seen the original Death Wish? No. Oh, okay, wow. have you seen the remake with Bruce Willis? No, we avoid that one. <laughs> yeah, just watch the Charles Bronson one. I mean, it, the Eli Roth one is okay, but you may as well just watch the original Charles. Dude, yeah, Bronson. you you gotta watch the, the the all the Death Wish movies. They all have their own thing, but the original has one of the first appearances of Jeff Goldblum, and he yes. plays a yes. hoodlum. And it's great. Also, amazing score. And it's funny, too, because uh, in Death Wish 3, it was like one of Alex Winter from Bill and Ted's first movie where he plays a thug. The nice. Death, Death Wish movies were a great opportunity to get your start as thugs. The first Death Wish movie um, is the one that proved to me how spot on the impersonation of Charles Bronson that's always on The Simpsons is. <laughs> hey, Pally. It's totally... Whenever Charles Bronson would be on there, I'm like, oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's The Simpsons. <laughs> Probably my favorite Charles Bronson joke on the show is like the, the Simpsons are trying to go to Branson, Missouri, and they end up in Bronson, Missouri, where everybody <laughs> looks like Charles Bronson, even like... Even the baby. <laughs> yeah, even like this kid and his mom. Hey, Ma, can I have a cookie? No dice. This ain't over. <laughs> And, uh, but no, no, but seriously though, I, I'm surprised people don't talk about Death Wish 3 more because, like, the climax is just pure Golden and Globus. It's like the entire New York City Police Department fights this giant army of, uh, thugs and gangsters that overtake this community, and then all the neighbors start pulling out gun, guns and booby traps and stuff. And it's just like <laughs> the, the, like, the last 20 minutes is just a full blown shootout and explosions and Charles Bronson fighting the bad guys and uh like he blows up a dude point blank with a rocket launcher and it was like just it got a standing ovation that's incredible and that's that's why i always say some of the best double features is just any death wish movie and punisher war zone because they both just match each other in like that type of tone so well plus any chance to plug in punisher war zone available now on dvd blu-ray and digital is well worth anyone's time. True. All right. What else is happening? Well, I got a special thing for all of our listeners. Mm -hmm. I got the second printing of the Mr. Babadook pop-up book. Uh, it's the final run. If you guys can see, it's very pretty. It's, it looks, it's screen accurate as fuck. Oh, it pops up. Yeah, it's the full pop-up book. I, I, I'm narrating the, the golf narration. He's like, he opens the book and the Babadook pops out of the door. <laughs> oh, wait, you guys can't see this, can you, listeners? I'm sorry. All you have to know is it's fucking amazing. I'll post pictures once the episode airs, but I'm not one for uh, reproductions or mem or like that type of memorabilia for movies. But when I saw that the producers from the film were uh, doing a second and final run of this, I had to get it because it is it is a great conversation piece. And that conversation is always, well, if it's in a look, it's in a book, <laughs> if it's in a book, you know, it's the Babadook. <laughs> but yeah. Other than that, I just rewatched Knives Out again, which is always a great time. <laughs> hey, have you guys seen on this? Um, I kept seeing sponsored ads on Facebook for it, for that service called Movie Spree. Yeah, that's Mill Creek's uh, yeah, streaming service. It's, it's Mill Creek. And the thing is, you sign up and there's a code. It's like 100 movies free or something. It's some ridiculously easy thing to that, you know, it says exactly what it is. And they give you 100 movies. And they're, um, I did that and I signed up. I got my free 100 movies. And then there's an, they have a bunch of other dollar bundles. So I got another 100 for a dollar more. It was, it's movies galore for a dollar more is what that bundle's called. So now I have 200 movies for a dollar. And, None of them are that good. <laughs> no, the, 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 well, you kind of have to dig. There's a lot of stuff like like old Hercules movies and um, old '70s TV movies. Um, you know, stuff like that in there. There, there, there's some good horror in there. But um, there's a bunch of other dollar bundles that don't quite have a hundred movies. They'll have like you know. 10 or 12 but there's one dollar bundle that is called men in suits and it is a bunch of monster movies where the monsters are guys and so it made me think of you guys um <laughs> it's like one of them is that movie mutant 
Oh, yeah. I think yeah, it's from with... the 80s. I'm not sure that I've ever even seen it. I've just seen the name a lot. But that's one. And there's like, um, there's another one that's, it's not uh, Destroy All Monsters. It's Destroy All Planets. Yeah. Um, but they, there's just a bunch of basically monster movies that the monster is played by a guy in a suit. <laughs> It's kind of funny. Anyway, it's it's kind of an interesting service. It is Mill Creek, so it's those. It's it's the streaming equivalent of one of those fifty movies for a dollar DVDs that you used to see at yeah, you know, Fry's or Walmart. It's basically the streaming equivalent of that. And it's where you go to redeem your digital codes for Mill Creek. So like, uh, yeah, my digital code for like uh, documentary now would work on that. But and the streaming service isn't that bad. It's just. Oh. I mean, it works. I mean, it's yeah. it's most of what I've seen, and you know, of my two hundred movies, I've watched three of them. It's all it's all standard def, but yeah. mainly because it's so old. Like I watched. Uh, there's one called uh, "The Night America Trembled," which is it's an old um, television play about Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, but it's not War of the Worlds. It's them doing the radio play of it and how it freaked out the public. So that was kind of right. cool. And then um, I, there was a TV movie called The Death of Richie, which is about a kid who does drugs and dies. You know, it's Robbie Benson plays Richie, but uh, Clint Howard is one of his druggy buddies, which is kind of cool. Of course, that Clint Howard. And then that, that movie from the late 90s, The Clown at Midnight, is uh was one of them too so i mean the streaming service is actually pretty solid as far as mechanics go but it's all standard def stuff so it's not really taxing your connection too heavily to watch so anyway it's a cool little cheap way to get loads and loads of movies and you know they're it's mill creek stuff so you know you're not going to be expecting you know knives yeah. out through movie spree but <laughs> well know. i my only thing is I wish they had, like, uh, a streamable app, because right now it's only web browser-based. Uh, I have it on my Roku. Oh, you, they do have it on Roku? Okay. Now, so- I, I had trouble finding it, though, because it's not called Movie Spree. It's just called Spree. Spree on that. Okay. Yes. But yeah. um, but it's on my Roku. I don't know what other devices. I haven't uh, checked for any other services. I just got it on my Roku. But they do have it, you know, yeah. and it's 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 pretty solid. I wish it was MA compatible. I know I'm I'm one of those. I'm a, I'm a big digital collector now, and uh, yeah, I just wish everything was MA. What's MA? Uh, movies anywhere. Yeah. Uh, movies anywhere. I can only imagine movies. Uh, my voodoo library going up by two hundred movies because they link movie spree. <laughs> Do you, I my the discrepancy in numbers between my voodoo and my ma is about three hundred movies difference. Yeah. M- mine is a, is about great. that too. That's the stuff that doesn't port. But that's also the stuff that's always the cheapest. Is yeah. the stuff yeah. that won't port most of the yeah. time. That's how it goes. I bought yeah. compliance for five bucks on Fandango oh, now, and it doesn't port to oh. voodoo. <laughs> so when I want to watch compliance, I have to go to Fandango now. Which Fandango's in bed with Roku, so it's like it's easy to get to on a Roku. But still, I'm, I I like everything in the same place. It would be nice, but I mean, it's a lot better than what it used to be before mm. MA introduced. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. At least, yeah, at least some stuff does cruise all over the place. Um, And I got another movie I wanted to talk about. Uh, I got to see uh, this Irish horror comedy called Extraordinary. Two words. I heard about that. Um, One of my uh, critic friends, he actually just messaged me last night. And he said, stop what you're doing. Go to the arc light and see Extraordinary. <laughs> Well, your friend was right. You should be doing that. Yeah, he he said that it was incredible. It was. uh, Yeah, I got to go to a premiere screening at the Alamo. I didn't really know what to expect going in. I saw a trailer, but, you know, it looked pretty interesting. And I'm a big Wolf Forte fan. Uh, But no, it was very well worth it. Like, it has a lot of heart. Uh, It's got some surprisingly gory and uh weird moments to it uh basically uh uh Maeve Higgins uh plays a uh driving instructor slash psychic medium who can see ghosts and uh she's contacted uh by a local played by uh Barry Ward uh, because his daughter won't stop floating and like she's possessed or something and also his former wife haunts uh their house and overbears him but yeah, will forte really stands out he plays a washed up uh like rock star or like synth rock star from like the 80s or something who's 
uh, career went down the, the toilet and he only had like one hit so he decided he's gonna sacrifice Barry Ward's daughter to Satan so that he can get fame and uh, riches again and it it uh, kind of has like a Shaun of the Deadish vibe to it, uh, with you know like Ghostbusters, like it's kind of down to earth, uh, and it's it's got a lot of funny, yeah, quirky characters. Um, so yeah, no, it's just very fun and it's very funny, and uh, this is the kind of independent horror cinema people should be checking out. Yeah. When my friend had messaged me about it, um. I looked through my emails and I did get an offer for a screener for it like three weeks ago. And I just had so much else going on in my life that I had to put some things on the back burner. And that was one of the things that did. And now I kind of regret it because I want to see it. <laughs> I, I've heard I've heard that it's really good. No, it is really good. And you should see it now. Yeah, you had me at Will Forte. <laughs> yeah, you just can't go wrong with Will Forte. The poster kind of reminded me of a comedic version of the Housebound poster. Yeah, it does have that look, like uh, Will Forte and the other cast just kind of standing there, and and then a ghost. Yeah, and he's, yeah, with a ghost, and like he's holding the and Will Forte is holding like the Necronomicon. I mean, he's not really, but yeah, uh, but no, it's re- it's really good, and you know we always want to uh, recommend good indie horror, and that is some pretty damn good indie horror. Yeah, cool. Support your local horror. Let's move into the meat of our episode here, which this is a a special, this isn't just a regular topic. We actually have a couple of guests here. Um, We have film composers Max Arouge and Stefan Toom. How you doing, guys? Very well. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you for being here, for taking some time out of your Sunday afternoon to to chat with us. Uh, Max and and Stefan, uh, they were the composers behind the score to one of our collective favorite movies of last year crawl yeah which if you if you didn't see crawl uh do yourself a favor and see crawl <laughs> because i think we've already gushed enough about crawl uh they and, and they've also worked on a lot of other interesting stuff that we will get to but uh first off um how did you guys get started in uh film scoring i mean how, what what brought you guys to it well i was a pianist first and i've been playing basically my whole life and then in high school i wrote some music and i thought oh this is this is fun i like this and then i decided to go to college for it had a blast and then after college and during college I met Lauren Balf and Hans Zimmer and then I started working at Remote Control Studios which is where I am now and then it's just been a ride ever since then and then Stefan and I met um, when he started here and how, how did you get started? Yeah I, um, I started here I think for me it's been about six almost six years here um i came to la originally from germany just for an exchange here of studying and then um yeah got got to know lauren as well through a uh, a lucky coincidence and yeah that was it how did you guys end up working together because you guys work together a lot yeah like i mean do you guys work together exclusively no, we, we kind of take it project by project. And when things come up and there's a tight deadline and, uh, you know, let's say it comes through the studio, then you know, we'll happily work together and and kind of split the workload and collaborate because it's a lot of fun. And now we've kind of built a bunch of contacts while working together. So it's kind of been a really nice blessing. And we, we kind of share the same studio environment. Um, so it's it's kind of we, we, see, we pretty much see each other every day. It's like an old married couple by now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great dynamic to have, though. It, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's hard to come by. I I think in the big scheme of things, it's hard to come by people you really get along with and work well with and you can have a lasting relationship with. And I think Lauren kind of creates that environment where it's a place where you work and it's a place where you grow relationships and one is just as important as the other. Definitely. Talking about your studio environment, um, because the the score to crawl is it all electronic? It's it's a it's a broad mixture of things. It's it has a couple of electronic elements. It has um, it has live orchestra, strings and brass, and that was actually my question because there are parts of it that sound like they could be an actual live orchestra, but they also could be synthesized. So you actually did use live players for for some of it. We we recorded quite a bit of of music with with string and brass, but there's also a fair amount of 
sounds that we just heavily met that, that sounds that are originally acoustic or organic if you will that we heavily messed with so it's it's all a, a blend of sorts um that was kind of also the idea behind it to, to really create something that's in between those worlds but always has some uh, sort of an organic feel to it it's got a real retro vibe sort of like the the retro synth scores of of the 80s but also that kind of made a comeback with movies like it follows you know and starry eyes that kind of thing so that's why i was wondering if it ever did exist in the analog form or if it was all synthesized but it's uh it's so it's the, the stuff that was analog is processed then is what you're basically saying um i guess to a certain extent yes i mean there, there's there's some purely uh synth sounds in there and there's a lot of boat instruments in there like boat piano strings boat guitar, guitar strings um and those are just also heavily messed with in in some um some bits of the score and the goal i think was that to a certain degree you don't quite know if what you're hearing is acoustic or electronic because at a certain point in the process we, uh, the director and producers were really liking, and so so basically we had a meeting, and Alex, Sam, Craig, and Elliot were all there, and we had a sound that we really liked, and they really liked for the Gator, and then Lauren said, well, we're going to make some new sounds that are kind of mimicking each other. So we had the orchestra mimic synths, and the synths mimic orchestra and then we would play them at different points in the movie so it feels like the sound is evolving as the characters get more and more in peril. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it, it, it works perfectly. <laughs> yeah, no, it was super intense uh, seeing the movie. Um, and I actually wanted to ask, uh, how did you get involved uh, doing the uh, soundtrack for Crawl? We, we, uh, we got brought onto this, this project um, through Lauren and Paramount, um, yeah, it was it was kind of we got we got brought on and then it was it was a discussion to first do it maybe together with Lorne and then he 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 decided to just uh, take a an, a producer role for the score and um was kind of our our guardian angel so to speak or our, mm-hmm. our mentor for it and and um yeah, it was it was really a great process that we were able to kind of um have fun with it. I know I have to ask you you guys were talking about specific notes, especially with the Gators. Uh, how, first of all, how much fun was it trying to come up with your own sound for when the Gators come in and try to make that kind of unique? Were you guys uh, heavily influenced by other animal attack movies like Jaws or uh, Killer Croc or anything like that when coming up with that distinct sound? Well, when when we had our first meeting, that's the first conversation you had is about Jaws, of course, because it's the <laughs> you know the greatest the greatest kind of creature movie ever made. So that that that's that's one of the first thing the first fifteen minutes we talked about, and we we talked about why that's successful, and then we sit down and we said, okay, we need something that uh, oh you know it was one of the first thing they wanted they wanted something that sounded primal, so or ancient or something like that. Yes. So. So that was, the, so when if you ask, was it fun? When you ask, was it fun coming up with it? It was yeah. fun coming up yeah. with the sounds, but the best part was when they really responded to one and they and they said, oh, that's the one. And then when you roll with it, you know you're on the right track, and that's a good feeling. But up until you find that right sound, you're thinking, is this right? Oh, this is cool, but is this the sound? So it's a process. It's really it's a process, and it's it's fun, and it but it's also hard. Yeah. It's yeah. just it's just the whole concept again of of Jaws hearing hearing those two notes before you see the shark and you already know something's coming, and and right. kind of using that that same concept with with our language and and our sounds to kind of create that same emotional response. You, you hear it and it's like oh man something's about to happen, and you just basically sit there in in your seat waiting for it. Yeah, because you can see that structure like you were saying of the two notes coming before you know, the the gator comes or the creature, the event happens. But it's definitely not once was I sitting there going, oh, man, they're just doing Jaws. But, like, <laughs> the structure of, of what Jaws did is definitely there. But no, no, never once did it feel like you guys were trying to knock off what uh, John Williams did, of course. Great, yeah. We, we It's very difficult to compete with that. So we yeah. we figured we're going to do our own thing the best we can. Yeah. 
on that note, uh, how would you say you coordinated uh, the scare chords or the scare tracks with uh, the action in the movie? Again, it, it's a process. It was a lot of trial and error of thinking, okay, how much space do we want to have between all these different things that the score needs to do and the film is trying to do? If there's a scare and we need to be there with the audience and really scare them, but then 10 seconds later, we're back to action. So a lot of it was thinking, okay, how do we really need to come back with the action immediately or how long can we wait? Because I think the trick with these scores is is being as tasteful as possible in following the story but not being too obvious and not constantly slamming people with hits and it's it's a lot about waiting and then in the end watching it through you know in, in a big chunk to see does is this too much are we hitting you guys over the head too much and so a lot of the time it's trying it and then moving back and saying no we can wait before we come slamming back in with pulse because we need to give everybody a second to breathe mm-hmm there's there's also always a, a good lesson to be learned to see where music can help a scare and where it just doesn't need to be there. I think one of the most effective ones at the beginning of the movie for, for Crawl was that moment when she, the, the lead actress walks through this house and the storm is already going and all of a sudden a tree crashes into the kitchen window. It's all it's all just sound effects. There's no music involved at that point, but it's one of the most effective ones because it just it just you f you feel so immersed in the moment because it's just sound. Sometimes music can help you with that. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, and you guys were very effective. I'm sure you uh, have seen this film with an audience a few times. What were some of your favorite reactions that came out of uh, out of the film? That that was a really good one. Yeah, the tree coming through. And, and also what's nice is sometimes when you're working on it in the studio, th there are certain moments that when you first watch it are, um, are, are scary or funny. And, and what got a good laugh in the theaters was when uh, the dad says, you know, go to the wet wall. And she says, all the walls are wet. And, and you forget <laughs> that's a good, good, funny line. And it's nice in the theater to have that surprise. And like, oh, wait a minute. There's these really nice moments of relief in here. Yeah. And yeah. and it's great to see that balance work work as well as it does, and also the yeah. mo the moment when well I don't know if, if I should say spoiler alert but when she's swimming, uh, and then she almost gets caught that was a really good moment when she gets up on the boat just in time so that if it's a spoiler you can remove that but <laughs> <laughs> if there's maybe there's, it's too far past the release date but yeah there were some really good moments in there yeah. I have a question about something earlier on in your career. Um, you guys worked on Dunkirk with Hans Zimmer, and you guys were credited as technical score assistants. What is a technical score assistant? That's basically this, a technical score assistant is the person who helps the composer um, all along the, the process of writing and producing the score to make the composer's life easier. So that's basically handling all the technical issues, um, troubleshooting if something goes wrong, but also um, assisting with the preparation of score, meaning the written music for the for the players once we go into rec the recording stage. And um, yeah, just, just um, deliveries for the mixer and dub stages... Um, so really, really, it's it's mostly a technical position, which then later also can advance into um, helping arrange themes, um, adjusting written music to a new picture cut. So we we constantly get an, a new um, cut version of of picture. So the music that was written and has maybe 10, 20 hit points for let's say an, a piece of action music that has to hit certain uh, moments to picture. We got a new cut. The whole sync is different, so we need to adjust our music um, to still fit the scene and, and hit all those same spots. So that's also part of the task that we do, and and that's what that position basically is mostly. Okay, cool. Uh, I wanted to ask back on the uh, crawl soundtrack. Uh, what did you think when it was announced that it would be getting a uh, physical vinyl release? We were thrilled. Yeah, yeah very excited. It was so unexpected and. But yeah, it was very exciting. It was exciting to be a part of a movie that it was fun. It was just a great process, and it was well-received. People enjoyed it. And then when we got the news about the vinyl, we just thought, man, what a nice way to cap off a great project. It was just just a nice blessing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's through uh, Mondo, right? 
uh, Rusted Waves, actually. Rusted Waves. Rusted, Rusted Wave, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did the awesome um, Bill and Ted uh, record release where they had the Wild Stallions cover that <laughs> yeah, right I on. admire <laughs> so much. <laughs> now, is this the first time you guys have one of your uh, scores come out on vinyl? Yes. yes. For, for us personally, yes. Um, Mondo, Mondo yeah. did a great release last year of... Um, of uh, Mission Impossible Fallout that also had a really cool cover. Uh, Mondo does great stuff in general, but that was a, also a, a really nice looking vinyl release. And you guys had some music on that or did you do the full track for it? No, I, again, that was one of Lauren's scores that we that we worked on or, or basically helped him do the, um, do the music for it. And that was, yeah, also a, a quite a quite involved process but also a lot of fun oh awesome but crawl is this is all you guys this is all yours and uh this is awesome that it's getting a vinyl release that must feel oh awesome. absolutely <laughs> yes yes yeah we're really appreciative of rusted wave and, and wendy ford also it's where we're very very happy excellent now do you guys have any upcoming projects in the works uh you're going to continue to keep uh scoring together as like the main composers yeah, we have some stuff in the works together, and then we also have our own stuff in the works. So, yeah, we're, we're keeping very busy. Anything you can discuss, or does it have to be hush-hush for now? <laughs> there, there's some hush-hush stuff, but um, also some of the the recently um, finished up things, or at least finished up. It, it's, not, it's not officially released yet, but I, I just, last month, I finished a, a small um, horror movie from the UK, called tribal get out alive um and it's it's kind of a um it's it's not it's not zombie horror you know you know how how would you dis distinguish between zombie horror and infected horror so it's basically it's infected horror there's again one mad scientist is to blame for everything um so you, you usual thing but there's there's also a fair amount of um really cool action sequences involved because the director has a, a, a long background in um, in martial arts and fight choreography so he, he has some really cool um, action sequences in there so it's it's part it's part horror part action movie let's get into some of the the um, the questions that you guys have probably answered a million times um, what uh, film composers influence you what what are some of the film composers that not necessarily guys that you've worked with but guys that you just that you like to listen to well historically uh, Bernard Herrmann was definitely a huge influence on me starting out as I'm sure so many people would say he really was just a master of of understanding the psychology of what's going on on screen and the psychology of the characters and as the viewer so I think I'd have I'd have to say him. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and, you you probably can't go without. Yeah, the, the the giants will always be there, like Bernard Herrmann, Morricone, John Williams. Um, but also really, really enjoying like more recent um, scores and, and guys like Johnny Greenwood, who who always does really cool scores. Um, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross. Yeah, guys like that. Oh yeah, their their recent scoring for Watchmen was just awesome just absolute yeah. breathtaking <laughs> i actually wanted to see johnny greenwood and tom york go up against each other at the oscars for you were never really here and suspiria but didn't happen <laughs> unfortunate I, I i yeah i think for, for the best that probably wouldn't be good for a band <laughs> <laughs> or, or, may, or maybe they're, they're so close where it would be a celebration i don't know maybe yeah. it'd be great i think that they would probably be happy for each other i think yeah. that it, it would be like you know they had twice the chance of winning right i think that they would be i think they'd be happy for each other but i don't know maybe there is a rivalry there who knows they're they're a successful band i i one would hope that they've they have a great relationship but um yeah i don't know now are there any since you know we're we're big on horror are there any big horror uh franchises you know whether or not there's something in development or not was there with is there one franchise that you guys would want to do a score with like you know say uh work on a sequel so that you could rework the original kind of like um uh with with the recent like Godzilla movie how they how Bear McCreary reworked the uh iconic score for and made it his own uh is there any that you can think of that you would want to do that with and mess around with 
That's a good question. Very good question, um, yeah. You know, I, I think on the day-to-day, -day we work so much, we just kind of keep our heads down. But, you know, then something will come up that's totally unexpected. So it's it's tough to say. Um, what, would, what would you say, Stefan? Hmm. It's a tricky one, yeah. There, there's, there's certain things that you just love and admire, but then you wouldn't you wouldn't even dare touching it because you don't think it could be approved upon like it's something like um the original evil dead trilogy and even the remake was pretty cool um but also then there's the show um ash versus evil dead yeah it's just the, that kind of stuff is just so much fun it's just badass like yeah just just badass fun and you, you yeah it would be great to work on it simply to to see all that stuff and, and, and be on it, but who knows? Maybe maybe it is literally perfect as it is. <laughs> uh, back on uh, Crawl and speaking of Evil Dead, uh, did you get the chance to uh, uh, talk directly with uh, Sam Raimi and Alexander Asia while uh, composing the soundtrack? Yeah, and it, it was great. That was one of the best parts. Um, you have to be in the room with, with Sam Raimi and to hear him give feedback and kind of hear his, really his global understanding of how you make a film. How you make a film and it, you, there's all these minutia involved, but then you step back and you say, wait a minute, we're doing this scene in Act 2 the same way we're doing it in Act 3. We should be doing it differently from a sound perspective. And then it kind of makes you sit back and go, okay. You know, it may have been done right or some version of it's right, but we need to take another stab at it. So to kind of be a part of that, that's really the, the nitty gritty of the filmmaking process and evaluating your own work. So that, that was a really special thing to do with, with him. Yes. And actually, uh, I interviewed uh, Sam Raimi and Alexander Asia when they were doing the uh, press events for Crawl, and I always and I asked all of them this. So I thought it'd be fun to ask you guys: uh, which do you think is scarier, alligators or hurricanes? I think alligators. Alligators, because they're so yeah. up close and personal. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's the chance of survival, so it really gets your heart pounding. Whereas a hurricane, if you're if if you're too close to it, that's it. I think. Yeah. So, so I hear. Yeah, you can't look a hurricane dead in the eyes and see right. it making a choice about you. Right. It just, just comes at you. You can't punch a hurricane in the nose. No. That too. <laughs> but I've tried, you know. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> uh, not as much as most Florida men, though. <laughs> awesome. Now, uh, who, are some, um, who are some filmmakers that you guys... Uh, are like on your wish list or that you just want to collaborate with uh, in the future because you guys have already worked with so many uh, powerhouses it looks like I think yeah we've, we've been super lucky and fortunate to work with some awesome people um, I think given given the question I think we'd have to say Quentin Tarantino <laughs> I yeah. think it's safe to say since he liked it so much to, 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 to see a headline like that's like whoa you know Alex really made a great movie here and we're happy to be a part of it and so glad that someone like QT enjoyed it although he oh, basically he, he if he truly has one movie left in him and the chances of him using original score in these movies, we all know how slim that chance is, so <laughs> we keep our fingers crossed, but maybe this can be another platform to throw it out there into the universe. Quentin, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. These guys are available. Well, he's he says he's got one more movie left, but he's already teased Kill Bill Three, Friday the thirteenth, and a Star Trek movie. So you know, what's it gonna be? Right. Not to mention T V projects. Yeah. He's, he's been teasing too now, so there could be a lot of opportunity coming up. I don't want him to quit. I enjoy all of his movies, and if he keeps making them that good, <laughs> yeah, keep going. No, I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, it would be great to get a Hateful Eight sequel though. <laughs> a sequel? Who's still alive? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It would be a much smaller number, like the Hateful, like what two, three? The hateful two. It would just be a nature yeah. documentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for that as long as it's still shot in 70 millimeter. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> right. And they still use that song from Last House on the Left. Or better yet, double it, The Hateful 16. Ah, oh, twice as many people in one room. Yeah. They're really yeah. angry this time. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Dahmer U gang finally gets there. <laughs> and that's where it picks up. Okay. Now, now, we're going, now we're going off topic. Yeah. Going a little off the rails there. 
So is there any chance that you're going to take the Crawl uh, soundtrack on the road like John Carpenter or Hans Zimmer does and do, do it live? <laughs> <laughs> One day, maybe. Yeah, we'd love to. <laughs> when, when, when that happens, uh, you're going to be the first to know about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we Thank break you. the story here. <laughs> Hell yeah. I will definitely be there. Uh, just hopefully no one brings dogs, because when I went and saw Crawl in theaters, someone brought their dog uh, to the screening, which was very interesting in that we didn't know there was a dog in the theater. So when the dog in the movie started barking, it started barking. <laughs> and I was just like, no way was the sound oh, mixed boy. this well where it sounds like there's a dog <laughs> behind me very interacting <laughs> exactly uh, at least no one brought a gator that would have been yeah uh, yeah their emotional support gator <laughs> <laughs> i don't know maybe in florida they did that's that seems to be a florida thing jacksonville <laughs> all right uh w- let's start wrapping this up do what do you guys have any other questions for him uh, korea or jacob anything we haven't covered not off the top of my head, no. A- anything you guys want to plug, Max and Stevan? Um, I worked on a comedy at the end of last year that's being wrapped up. It's called Miu Madness. And I'm not sure when that's being released, but um, have a look out for that. And it's called Miu and Madness? Definitely keep an eye out for that. I, you guys sound like you have some like really cool projects. Uh, like You were talking about like uh, a pandemic movie and a, now a comedy with madness in the title. I'm stoked. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a wide range there. Yeah. <laughs> but they still have to make time to take Crawl live on, on the road. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> that okay, cool. Awesome. Let's, let's, uh, let's wrap up. Uh, our theme song is by Restless Spirits, so go give them a, a shout. And uh, our uh, artwork was by Chris Fisher. Um, where can uh, the people find you guys on like social media? Do you guys have Twitters? Uh, Max and Stefan, do you guys have Twitter or Instagram? Yes, I'm we Max are, Rouge yeah. on Twitter and Instagram. And yeah, just M-A-X-A-R-U-J. Okay, and Stefan? Yeah, Stefan Toom as well um, on, on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook. And, and you, you also find it through our websites. Um, the links are there. So yeah. Where's your website? Uh, stephantoom.com and maxarouge.com. Okay. okay, great. And oh, awesome. we'll link that too so that they get the spelling right so they so people can find it. Cool. Um, yeah. Me, James J. Edwards, you can find at Cinema Ferite. That's like Verite, but F-E-A-R-I-T-E on Twitter. Uh, Jacob, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at Jacob Davison underscore on Twitter. That is at J-A-C-O-B-D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore for twitter and you can also find uh my writing in the horror anthology podcast series dead time stories on itunes and all that okay and korea uh you can find me on twitter and instagram at korean barbecue uh that's c-o-r-r-e-i-a-n-b-b-q and uh also on our stardust for ihor and uh just don't forget, guys, uh, the uh, awesome soundtrack that these two put out for our uh, made for uh, crawl is available at rustedwave.com. There's two different versions. Well, there was two different versions. The Apex Predator variant, which looked awesome, uh, sold out already. But you can still get um, the uh, regular version, which is still just as great sounding, I assume, uh, as well. Um, what did the Apex Predator version look like? Was, was it a... a... Uh, it looks really cool it's it's uh clear with blue and oh, okay. uh black and gray splatter within it i'm i'm a sucker for cool. colors yeah. so, super yeah. cool design yeah uh i missed out on that but uh the regular version is still available and it's still a great uh score especially uh rusted wave i already gushed about them earlier they do uh some really good stuff with their releases what hot american summer is still one of my favorite ones that they've put out <laughs> <laughs> okay cool well you can find all three of us at ihorror.com the eye on horror facebook page or the ihorror facebook page uh stefan and max thanks for hanging out with us this afternoon and and indulging us with our questions thanks so much for having us thanks guys so uh we will see you next time uh for me james j edwards i'm jacob davison i'm jonathan korea keep your eye on horror